Good evening and a warm welcome to our Green Turk Circular Economy with Local Initiatives to Success. The government of Catalonia has committed to the end sustainable goals with its national plan for the implementation of the 2030 agenda in Catalonia. The government works together with pioneering organizations uh, promoting actions to achieve those SDGs. Therefore, as a delegation of Catalonia to Central Europe, we want to offer a platform in order to discuss these topics with different stakeholders and to support their international networking. The Green Talk series focuses on civil and bottom-up initiatives, presenting sustainable networks and offering best practice exchange aligned with the SDGs. And this time we concentrate on circular economy, which is also a topic that is already quite active. There's a lot of things happening in the area of circular economy in Catalonia. And uh, we are very happy to present uh, our speaker, Anastasia Fustafido from FabLab Barcelona, who will present a successful project Remix El Barrio, which means something like uh, redefine, restore your neighborhood. This Catalan Circular Economy project was among the winners of this year's Stars Prize of the European Commission and presented at one of the most important innovation festivals in Central Europe at the Arts Electronica in Linz, Austria. We are also honored to count on the part participation of Lucy Nenkoa, co-founder of ISHOR, the Association for Municipalities of the Czech Republic, who will give her expertise as a specialist in the area of smart city and village, and circular economy in the Czech Republic. In her work, Lucy Nenkova deals with the topic of sustainable development in many forms, especially with regard to the implementation of the principles of circular economy. And last but not least, I am uh, honored to uh, hand over the word now to Executive Director of Global Goals Consulting, Patrick Tiefenbacher, who has more than 20 years of experience in development effectiveness and strategic planning and chaired the UN Strategic Planning Network. We are very excited that he is going to moderate our today's Green Talk. So thank you very much for joining. We hope uh, for an interesting discussion and the floor is yours, Patrick. Thank you. Our topic today is the circular economy at the local level, and we are joined by two expert practitioners. They will share with us their experience with the circular economy and will tell us more about recent projects that try to advance a circular economy. First up, we will talk to Anastasia Pistofidou, who since 2011 has been a member of the Fab Lab of the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia in a variety of roles. In particular, she mentored the Remix El Barrio pilot project, which recently won a prize at Ars Electronica and about which we will hear more today. Anastasia also co-founded the Fab Textiles Lab that focuses on experimental digital open source couture and the Fabric Academy, a textile and technology academy. Anastasia received advanced degrees in architecture in Thessaloniki and Barcelona. Second, we will hear from Lucy Nenchkova, who is the founder of ICE4, the Institute for Society 4.0, a think tank that supports and implements applied research and innovation in the area of sustainable development. She's an author and participated in the development of a strategic framework for smart cities for the Union of Towns and Municipalities of the Czech Republic. Lucy holds a PhD in environmental policy and is a member of the faculty of the Institute for Sustainable Business of the University of Economics in Prague. Previously, she worked as project manager for the Central Bohemian Innovation Center. Welcome to you both. As mentioned, our topic today is the circular economy at the local level. 
And first, we want to learn a bit more about Remix El Barrio, which roughly translates as Recycle Your Neighborhood, which is a project that involves 12 local designers spearheading solutions how waste from local businesses can be turned into new materials and products. Anastasia, can you tell us a bit more about your project and the exciting new products you have co-developed? Yes, thank you, Patrick. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor to be here and also to be uh, in contact with Lucy. Um, the Remix El Barrio project uh, is a pilot project of Fabla Barcelona that um, implemented uh, circularity in a super local uh, level, in the level of the district of Poblano. And um, it has to do with new materials, so material science and how materials can uh, give solutions for biodegradable products uh, going against the petroleum-based plastics. Uh, so we incubated uh, 12 designers and uh, the, our role was to do the transfer knowledge to them uh, to show what are the possibilities, what are the recipes of these new materials. And then they had to identify and do a mapping of the area to identify the partners, the services, the restaurants, the neighborhood garden, uh, the association of, um, of neighborhood citizens, so that they can uh, collaborate with them uh, using their organic waste as a resource. Uh, the outcome is uh, outstanding because it's more than upcycling. Uh, it's something that is technological uh, breakthrough in terms of uh, material uh, science because we can make, for example, new type of wood that is based on olive pits. Uh, we can make a leather that is fruit leather made of orange peels. We can make paper uh, for graphics campaign or publishing that is made for, from coffee husks. Or a very, very important issue is the use of olive oil, the used olive oil that we can make, for example, soaps for cos cosmetics. But we also use digital fabrication, new uh, tools uh, where we can design the computer, we can 3D model objects, and then we can either laser cut them or 3D print them or uh, CNC mill them. Uh, to create also this new kind of aesthetics. And uh, this is because fab labs, like fabrication laboratories, are these accessible spaces for society with different tools and that they can access and they can use in order to make, uh, first of all, uh, things for their needs, for the, uh, in terms of being self-sustainable, but also to create a new products that could uh, be alternative solution to the current one. Uh, the issue here is that we are creating biodegradable objects from art to graphic design, to uh, clothing, to different industries. We tackle different industries. And we also propose to see that the products that we use in our everyday life, maybe they are using materials that they are designed to live a lot longer. For example, a plastic bottle that uh, we drink, uh, we, buy, we buy a plastic bottle, we will use it only for uh, half an hour or one hour, but the material that is made from is used, is lasting 500 years. So this is uh, putting in the spotlight the role of uh, design in the process of the use and also the role of creativity. Wonderful. And you've already started to talk about the importance of design. And maybe I can um, prompt you to talk a little bit more about why design is such an important aspect for the life cycle of products. I think that uh, in, in the lifespan uh, of products, uh, we need to think from uh, in advance, uh, far ahead before creating the product, the whole product cycle. 
So when we, the design is important because uh, we don't go only until once the product is produced, then we are happy, but we go also in the afterlife design of the product, how it can be disassembled, how it can be recycled, how it can enter back in the loop. So this is what is circular design. And uh, also, I think that design is something that is communicative. We can talk about new concepts uh, of new aesthetics and new products through design, because design is uh, some language that everybody can understand. Great, thank you. You've already mentioned uh, plastic waste and how your project is trying to make a contribution in the fight against plastic waste, and I guess you know, because we are talking about the sustainable development goals, um, that's also a contribution to fight climate change. Um, what do you see as the practical contribution a project like yours can, can deliver together with civil society in the fight against plastic waste and uh, in, in the fight against climate change? Well, actually, the project tackles a lot um, more of the sustainable development goals, uh, apart from the climate change. Uh, I think that, um, first of all, implementing citizen science, which means that developing new solutions together with the neighborhood. Taking the science out of the lab is very important. First of all, because we can think uh, our uh, surroundings as uh, an incubation space where ideas can get born, tested, and uh, see their availability and also the, if they are impactful in our society. So we need to uh, stop thinking about R&D in a closed environment, but open the research and development to the citizens so we can have as well this collective in collective knowledge and intelligence. I think that the, um, we, all, we are all aware of the plastic problem uh, in our society because plastic is a very intelligent material, but we have been misusing it. It's too intelligent for use, to be used for everything. But this is the problem of also the market and the cost. Um, I think that we need to redesign objects and rethink how we make objects. Um, but also not uh, all, only, I think that the problem is that sometimes we only blame the industry, but then all the problem is in the uh, citizen that needs to learn how to recycle, that needs to learn how to, uh, how to organize and consume less. But in the end, I think that we should try to find all together commonly a solution by collaborating. And this is what this project is about, because apart from the citizen science, about like only creating this space for collaboration, it creates also somehow a manifesto uh, that we want to make a zero waste circular neighborhood. And other neighborhoods can also copy uh, and they can get inspired by our uh, initiative and they can replicate this in other districts, in other villages, in other uh, places all over the world. Then after the, the thing with material science and doing biomaterials is very interesting because there is a higher um, attraction to uh, gender-wise to female innovators. So it tackles also the part of uh, gender equality in innovation for the sustainable development goals. And I think it tackles many different uh, aspects, the project. Um, the most uh, impactful for me personally was how, because I have been uh, working in the research with organic waste uh, in a personal level, gathering my waste at home and coming to the lab, making different biomaterials. And the impact was when we massively exploded this, putting more designers to work together, more brains that they can find together solutions and also involving different stakeholders. To the end that we also wrote a manifesto for policy making 
which is uh, about uh, creating this kind of spaces where we can recycle uh, waste, organic waste in the neighborhood. It's about uh, making a, a car, a BC, a bicycle where we can carry the waste from the different uh, restaurants and we can bring them to that space. Foment, like uh, empowering the collaborations between different agents and uh, the, the municipality, asking the municipality to be involved in that and to create this space for innovation so that people can actually act, can be actors of change. Thank you. You have mentioned quite a number of really interesting aspects that all play into the circular economy concept uh, in terms of you know, interdisciplinary work, the, the co-design with stakeholders. I want to get back to what you also mentioned uh, with regards to the manifesto that you have developed. But before we get to that point, there was one thing that really struck me, what you just mentioned, um, and that was the idea that your project wants to take the science out of the lab and, and get uh, citizens much more involved in science, which of course is a fascinating aspect. Um, and you have mentioned how important it is that there is easy access to technology and tools. But on the other hand, people often get quite easily overwhelmed by science and technology. Why do you think that is? Um, I think that um, uh, taking the science out of the lab is also the mission, let's say, of the Fab Lab network of these maker spaces, of these common um, places where people with similar um, inspirations and interests can gather and exchange knowledge. Um, I think that uh, the way we communicate innovation and science is somehow overwhelming. Uh, because uh, we are not tackling only one discipline. So most of the times it can tackle different sciences like engineering and then product design and then material science. And you can, when you try to put all of these things together, then you don't have a target audience. You don't have one type of uh, target audience. Then this is basically the setup for creating innovation. When you put different agents that they are not related so much with each other, uh, you, can, you can put them together to bring solutions and put their brains together for that. So the thing is that when you're doing that, you need to communicate in a way that is easy and accessible for everyone in all ages, in uh, uh, the neighbor that is living here and may have a little shop that makes a craft or uh, some uh, other one that is an enthusiast in repairing bicycles. So you, you need to uh, make them understand what you're talking about. And in this case, and all of my personal trajectory in uh, all the years since 2011 that I have been working in Fabla Barcelona, is the open source culture, is how that we can, everything we do, document it in a way, publish it to the world so that the world can learn from our uh, errors, learn from our mistakes and move a step forward. And this also came in the Remixel Barrio uh, about its sustainability and replicability because the project didn't end at the moment we did the products. It ended, it, it, it didn't end actually, now it's starting, but it's starting like a second phase, but we documented open source tutorials where uh, you can see all the steps and the recipes that we are making for replicating these materials from wherever you are at home. And these open source tutorials are, is our gift to the world because we will not be uh, sustainable enough if we start flying all over the world for this. But we can leave this uh, piece of information for others to start working from there and develop a step further. And the open source is uh, a new mentality. Maybe currently the industry uh, is not working in these terms. Maybe the, we have 
the industry more working into uh, faster production, lower costs, objectives, but uh, maybe and competitiveness, but maybe the future is uh, more towards collaboration and more towards this human global collective intelligence that will make us uh, um, improve our world. Um, and the, yes, the open source part is super important. It's very important um, for others, for the others to learn and for the others to uh, yeah, be uh, one step ahead afterwards. Fantastic. It's a really interesting way of getting people excited about being part of a new movement and, and to um, collaborate, to, to dedicate some of their time to this and uh, to, to learn about new ways. Um, you've earlier mentioned already that uh, your project has developed a manifesto for policymakers. So uh, we would be interested um, what that entails because you've mentioned obviously the important roles that industry plays, that citizens play. I guess the manifesto is much more geared towards the public sector. So um, tell us a little bit more about that. It, the manifesto comes also as part of uh, this activist approach of um, because it was a way it was a way to communicate to have a manifesto um, through these uh, graphics uh, that were made out of waste also the everything was made out of waste so the manifesto in our case is um, when we put our dreams in a paper. And we say what we would ask uh, uh, the state to give us because we believe in that. And not only us, but also the whole neighborhood is involved. So it was putting down this dream into some words such as uh, more um, initiatives for uh, collaboration between the different stakeholders, having open days to learn what the artisans are doing around us and to get to meet each other. First of all, because this human dynamics is very important. Secondly, to um, apart from having a library, uh, public library, or apart, apart from having a public gym, maybe think about having a public recycling space. Um, implementing something in, in all the districts where can people can access uh, easily. For example, here in Barcelona, because Barcelona is quite a progressive city, I would say, and it is a, it is a field of innovation, a territory of innovation, and the scale of it uh, helps for that. And the city uh, hall last year implemented these uh, shared uh, tool spaces. So there is um, kind of like a library uh, where it has a driller, an electrical saw, a sewing machine, different tools uh, that the citizens can go and borrow as if they were borrowing a book and they can uh, use it at home. They don't need to invest and have their own tools and then they can return it to the library. So this was implemented uh, in the city of Barcelona, which is amazing, I think. Uh, and I would also, we, in our manifesto, we were proposing to also have these circular uh, maker spaces. One thing that you mentioned now and that in a way I wanted to get back on was that your focus has been very much around Barcelona, therefore very much around urban neighborhoods like the Barrio. Why did you choose urban environment? I mean, what were the advantages that you see of, of doing your project in an urban environment? <laughs> That's a very nice question because um, of, co of course I think that uh, sometimes in the cities, they are trying to uh, reinvent things that in villages they are obvious and so common. And it's their common sense for the villages. But I also believe that uh, there are many, a big population lives in the cities. Uh, there is There are so many topics to tackle and solve in the cities. And uh, I also think that the, you can implement the same in a village, of course. 
but at least uh, since we see that uh, the population is in the cities is still uh, growing we need to try to make the cities a better world for the people to live in and also the, the aspect of looking hyper local looking only in a district and creating this uh, stakeholder mapping and uh, all these connections is uh, actually making it as a little small village in the end. Of course, then all the documentation and the rigorosity of the project is what allows it to be replicated in other places of the, of the world. But if I was personally uh, had to uh, choose I would also uh, choose more uh, going towards the rural uh, circular maker spaces. I think uh, it is already happening somehow there. And uh, yeah, I think that also COVID uh, showed a lot that there is a somehow comeback towards going rural. Also, because we are so interconnected with digital technologies, we we can we we can afford to not to miss out uh, in many things. So, I think that um, we still there will still be many people living in the cities. So there are still things to be solved, and you can see also a lot of um, uh, in Barcelona a lot of fund coming for making green rooftops. Uh, uh, you can see the, the, that there is this intention of uh, uh, giving some funds for creating solar panels and facades of the building. So I think that there is a, a good territory to explore and to see how in these given conditions we can improve our way of living. Wonderful. I think we've gotten a much better idea about your project and how it helps put the concept of a circular economy into practice. Maybe my last question uh, to you would just be, given that you have received this uh, Ars Electronica Prize, how significant was that for the project? Uh, what did it enable you to do that without this prize you would not have been able to do? It was a big honor to win the Ars Electronica Prize. Uh, in personal level, I, I think it was one of my dreams since 10 years now. So personally, I was emotionally uh, very charged about this prize because it was something that I was always looking up to. Um, but uh, in, in terms of the project, it is magnificent because the pilot that we ran in Fabla Barcelona was already coming from a European fund, uh, the Cisco project, and it was coming to an end. And in the project, we already had put some little stones of the future of that, but we wouldn't know how to continue it without a small fund that can, in, can activate again everyone. So currently, Due to the Ars Electronica Starts Prize, we are forming the association, we have found a new space to be, we are setting up the uh, objectives for the year and uh, we, can, we made the, the Remix Collective, so a cooperative, an association that, that can continue working together. And this is, I think, massive. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Anastasia. And it's fantastic to hear that the project will continue thanks to the recognition that it has received. So we'll be turning to our second speaker, Lucy Nechkova, um, and we will look at the circular economy more through a rural lens. Um, the region of the Czech Republic that you focus on is characterized by small villages, um, often with just a few hundred inhabitants. And in a way, it's, it's a wonderful contrast to, in a way, the project we've just heard about. So we're really looking forward to learning a little bit more about the work that you have been involved in. But before we get into that, um, maybe it's worth taking a step back and to reflect a little bit about the idea of a circular economy. It's something that is very frequently cited now. But could you maybe give us a bit more of um, a formal definition or interpretation 
of what the concept of a circular economy means to you. Uh, okay, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here and thank you also to my colleague for a very interesting talk. Uh, usually, I, I try to explain to the audience that sil uh, circular economy has more principles than a little bit improvement waste management uh, because usually uh, many people think that this is this this is the core of circular economy but it's not it's not circular economy has three plus one pillars uh, the first three sustainable production and consumption uh, waste management of course it's a part of it uh, secondary and raw material policy and the, the, the plus one uh, is bioeconomy. So if we want to talk about circular economy, we have to we have to uh, view this big picture and we have to think about it uh, under these conditions. If we cut only waste management or only bioeconomy, uh, it's not uh, it's it's not the holistic approach and uh, also finding the proper solution. Uh, is uh, much more complicated and uh, it won't be so effective. Uh, circular economy for me personally, and also for many of my colleagues is also a part of a uh, smart city concept or smart villages, smart regions uh, concepts, uh, or to, to uh, just, we, we can just talk about smart concept uh, for different, uh, area units, uh, it's definitely part of it and we can apply uh, principles of smart concept also to the circular economy or combine it together to be uh, as effective as possible in finding solutions. Uh, to be honest, uh, my interest is uh, uh, focused to uh, rural, uh, rural areas or rural regions because as you mentioned, I worked for a Central Bohemian Innovation Center and a Central Bohemian region is the biggest region in the Czech Republic uh, with all issues and challenges uh, which you can uh, just dream about <laughs> uh, because there is very unique settlement structure with many small villages, more than 1000 vill small villages, uh, but the region has also issues and challenges related to rural areas and also metropolitan areas because in front of the uh, of the region is the capital uh, so you can make a one pilot in this region and uh, try and try to solve almost every issues and challenges um, which you can have in your mind Thank you so much for this introduction. And you've already mentioned a really important aspect that I want to zoom in on a little bit more. Um, you've mentioned that you've worked also for the central government on a development strategy for the Bohemian region. Um, it would be helpful maybe for all our viewers to understand a little bit more what you see as some of these important development challenges that the settlement structure is facing. What are some of the challenges, for instance, I guess, in terms of services um, that these um, uh, villages are facing given their size and, and how dispersed they are? Okay, so do you hear me? Everything? Yes, yes, we can hear. So, uh, rural areas um, have many different issues. Uh, many of them are usually related to infrastructural issues, uh, but uh, and services, of course. But uh, if we are talking about circular economy, we can also uh, we can also use this specific structure of services and infrastructure. Uh, to boost uh, different approaches, how to implement principles of circular economy in uh, the specific way, uh, which will uh, suit to, to rural areas mostly, but uh, it could be also helpful 
example uh, for uh, metropolitan areas, because in rural areas we can use many soft tools, uh, mainly based on prevention, uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, some, uh, some libraries uh, or um, facilities uh, using uh, different activities related to, uh, to sharing and stuff like that. We can work much more with uh, communities aspects, uh, which is very important because I don't know how it's in Spain, but here in Czech Republic, uh, I think that um, prevention is terribly undervaluated, uh, also using of soft tools. Um, and we are still looking uh, forward some um, investing money, but maybe we can uh, just make something uh, um, almost for free uh, uh, based on, on uh, prevention uh, and uh, soft tools. So it's really very important. And uh, also the aspect of collaboration is uh, the most important one. Collaboration, not only um, on the uh, civil society level, but on all uh, um, aspects or, or sectors uh, according to the quadruple helix model. So we have to combine uh, all of these activities together and uh, be able to share um, uh, our knowledge, to share our experience and uh, talk about it and collaborate. Um, it's not easy, uh, especially in case of public sector, uh, but uh, I think that the potential of rural areas for improvement um, in this field of interest, it, uh, it's, it's really, it's huge. So we are trying to, to uh, help and uh, to support these activities. Since we're already on the topic of the public sector and, and you obviously have worked a lot, with the public sector. Um, we earlier heard from Anastasia how important it was to, in a way, involve industry and, and, and civil society. Um, and out of the work of their project was a manifesto for policymakers, um, which obviously then feeds right into the work that you're doing. Um, but so what is it that you see as the biggest obstacles that prevents the public sector from becoming circular? Uh, it's definitely an uh, issue related with national law in the field of waste management and also circular economy itself, because it's under preparation. Uh, we, we will have soon, in a few weeks, hopefully, um, a new, new concept, uh, which is called uh, Circular Czechia 2040. So we are waiting for approval by, uh, by the government, uh, but still um, the, the, the law uh, is a little bit, uh, law preparation is a little bit pending at the moment. So we have no, uh, no clue how to, how to deal with this issue. And uh, I think that the public sector, um, especially on the regional level, must show to uh, all municipalities uh, in, in, uh, in uh, its district uh, how to deal with these issues or challenges. Uh, and it's not so common uh, because many people, even ex experts uh, who, are, uh, who are representatives of uh, regions, uh, they still think uh, about circular economy uh, as, as an improved waste management, as I mentioned before. So we, we have to change uh, our thinking about it. Uh, we have to change, uh, change it and make some kind of paradigm shift to be successful on this level and not only uh, build uh, some kind of uh, physical infrastructure, but also think about using uh, of soft tools, uh, which is definitely, uh, th th there is a huge potential how to support implementation of principles of circular economy, not only on the regional level. 
and also our personal approach is really very important. I think that is very interesting how the personal approach and, and uh, in a way, I guess, small uh, steps and small solutions can play a really important role in making circular economy concepts work. Um, there was another aspect that I found very interesting um, when you reminded us of the definition of, of circular economy. And, and that was that you also put a lot of emphasis on the economic dim dimension of sustainable de uh, development and that it's important not just to focus on the environmental uh, dimension of sustainable development. Um, can you tell us a little bit more how you see that interplay? between the economics and the environmental aspects um, and how they hopefully reinforce each other, but also how they maybe are at odds with each other? Uh, for me, it's definitely related, first of all, uh, with prevention. Uh, if you consume less, you can spend less. Uh, so I'm almost sure that this is the way how how to how to succeed, but not only on the personal level, but also of level of municipalities, of regional authorities, uh, even on the national level. But it's not easy to uh, communicate. To uh, communicate, uh, it's all of us feel that it's quite clear, but in practice, it's not. Um, as you can see, almost all of us. Uh, and the connection uh, between economy and between sustainability, uh, it's uh, not so easy uh, to explain. Uh, and maybe the, the biggest issue is not about um, higher price of uh, sustainable products, but uh, the biggest issue is related with buying of these new products, how to buy it according to the law. Uh, because if you have to buy uh, the, the, uh, 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 the lowest price, uh, it's always uneasy to buy uh, sustainable products. Uh, but the second issue is related with standardization. If we have, uh, if we have um, the, the level of standardization is still very low to choose the proper products, so uh, it's uh, also very complicated. But uh, back to your question, uh, the connection is also uh, related to something which is called zero goal approach. Uh, but it's also pretty uneasy to explain how it works, uh, how it works, uh, especially on the level of public sector. But uh, uh, I'm an optimist. I think that we are facing uh, an amazing uh, challenges related to sustainable uh, using sustainability products because during uh, uh, preparation and innovation processes and uh, and related research, uh, we can push uh, push the the the, the whole uh, system of sustainability and improvement on the European level. Great. I think you have given us a much better idea how we should think about circular economy and the various elements that make up the, the circular economy. You've just now mentioned also the importance that we're thinking uh, at the European level and, and in a way how challenging it is to ensure that Circularity is not just uh, something that is seen as 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 a element of waste management. That really it transforms in the way we produce and consume in a sustainable fashion. Um, I want to ask both of you a couple of questions, some of which might be a bit provocative, um, to get your perspectives. Given that you've also come to the topics from somewhat uh, different uh, perspectives, either from a rural perspective, from an urban perspective, maybe from a practitioner's perspective, um, as well as from an academic perspective. So I will ask a couple of questions uh, where I would be really interested to get your feedback. Um, 
And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with something quite simple, which is also a, a question about how you see yourself in this whole process. Um, the, this concept of social entrepreneurship has become quite fashionable over the over the last couple of years. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk about social entrepreneurship. Um, would you describe yourself as a social entrepreneur, and what does that mean for you? So maybe I'll start with Anastasia first. Yeah, that's a very good idea. A very good question, and I I think that. Um, in uh, my case, I wouldn't describe myself as a social entrepreneur, uh, even though there are many things that I'm doing related to that, because I, um, I feel that uh, in the case of the work that I'm doing within the context of education, open source, uh, innovation, um, disruptive technologies, um, uh, new ideas and uh, all of these. I, we, we say that we are again uh, the Renaissance people, that they are uh, people that they know different things at the same time and not having some specific, um, let's say, not be experts in only one thing, expertise. Um, the training is more transversal. Uh, we are citizens of the world. Uh, and um, then this is also the problem sometimes that we have because we don't fit in any specific role. Uh, we, don't, <laughs> we, we cannot describe easily the work that we are doing. Um, I think that um, the soft skills, uh, because I have also hard skills like uh, coding or designing or working um, with the machines, uh, all of these skills. I think that in social interpre entrepreneurship, uh, there, are, there is necessity of soft skills first to uh, listen uh, to uh, what the community needs. And in the project of Remix El Barrio, it is all based on a methodology of co-creation. So it was not uh, set in stone that we would uh, do uh, what we did. We, we heard the public, what they needed, what they was more interesting for them. And then after, together, all together, we designed the implementation. So I think there is the co-creation uh, is uh, key. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, the involvement, be before I was hearing Lucy and she was uh, saying about the public, uh, she said very, very relevant things to the things that I am also working with. For example, the certification of these new materials and products. Uh, so, but also that the problem here is that sometimes the public uh, is not, we don't feel that it's us. So when we say public, uh, uh, the public, the government, the public policy, the policy making, uh, it's all about the public, and but public is the citizens. So I think that the problem is that there is this detachment, and uh, I believe that social entrepreneurship is kind of trying to bridge this gap. Good, thank you very much. Uh, Lucy, let me turn to you because I know that a lot of the things that Anastasia just mentioned will resonate with you, but uh, let's start off with the same question. Would you consider yourself a social entrepreneur? Uh, yes, definitely yes. Um, we, uh, we had talking a lot about it and I thought how to, how to describe it. And I think that our main goal, our main aim is uh, to support collaboration, as I mentioned before, among research, civil society, uh, and public sector. Uh, business sector is a little bit out because I'm sure that there are other tools how to do that uh, and other, uh, other organizations and just other tools and also policies how to, how to do that. But uh, this specific collaboration uh, among research, civil society, and public sector to, together, uh, it's not so often. 
and we are trying to use our research backgrounds uh, because uh, my colleagues uh, have different research backgrounds uh, from energy sector and I don't know what, it's, it's quite wide. So we are trying to push these activities uh, to push people to collaborate together uh, to, to face our uh, issues and challenges. And we are trying to help them uh, to find the proper solutions, uh, how to deal with it. Great, uh, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to go back to a question um, that Anastasia implicitly raised. Um, she was thinking about the effect the COVID-19 pandemic might have. And, and so I want to follow up on that. Um, in a way, the pandemic has highlighted the risk of global supply chains that might get disrupted. Um, but it, at the same time, has also reminded us that no country and no region is, is, is shut off and isolated. Um, you know, we are all affected by phenomena like uh, climate change and, and, and the pandemic. Nobody uh, can escape it. So do you think that the experience that uh, we collectively have now gathered with the COVID pandemic will have an effect on our thinking about the circular economy? And maybe Lucy, let me start with you this time uh, for a first response. Uh, yeah, I have uh, three notes here related to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, uh, improvement of local economy, definitely yes, is the side effect, uh, as we can see around everywhere. Uh, the second one, the, probably the most important one, is resilience. Um, boosting of resilience and also the world itself it's now everywhere. And possibly also uh, the urbanization. It's related to our uh, discussion before uh, about rural and metropolitan areas. Uh, maybe people uh, don't uh, need to, to commute. Uh, maybe they can stay in countryside, they can work from countryside, especially if the digitization of rural areas will be more successful and faster. Uh, maybe we are facing to this new trend, which is called the urbanization, but we, we will see soon. Thank you. Well, Anastasia, since you mentioned this earlier, I'm sure that you have a couple of things to say about the relationship between the COVID-19 pandemic and, and how you see that play out in the context of uh, the, the uh, circular economy. So please. Yeah, I, it is a combination between COVID-19 and the a depletion of uh, resources that uh, it's a clock that is ticking backwards and um, i think that this at the same time puts a lot of pressure so we have an effect in society a psychological effect in society that is the heavy weight of all of these things that are going to happen but as we know humanity is always the most adaptable species so um the ideas and the creativity are boosting to find solutions in the facing this wall <laughs> that is coming towards us. And um, uh, first of all, I think that a lot of young people decided that they can be living in the countryside and working remotely. Secondly, and this is kind of the core of my practice, because in 2017, I founded this program, which is called the Textile and Technology Academy. And it has been always online distributed, running simultaneously in many places all over the world. And this is part of the core of the Fab Lab Network. So reimagine education, because the education is not a school anymore. And we learn so many things online. We can uh, doubt and we can question our teachers at school because we found the correct information ourselves online. And education is key 
So education is the first thing for circular design, for circular economy, for activating the people. And since COVID is moving the grounds of education itself, they, there is a massive need to reinvent ourselves. And e everything that we will do will go towards something better. Well, if I can just uh, connect to, to that point straight away, um, in your earlier answer, you also mentioned that there is a little bit of a, of a, of a desire to reconnect with the values and standards of the Renaissance, you know, people who have multiple skills, who have a very uh, diverse interest, who are, you know, experts in, in, or at least have expertise in a lot of different areas. And of course, that also requires different types of education. Um, and of course, it's, 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 it's super interesting to have this idea that that we would be able to um, excel, not just in, in one discipline, but could think together um, different disciplines and therefore come up with new solutions that otherwise we would never think about. Um, but isn't there also a bit of a tension that when we think about the way in the Renaissance uh, products were produced, they were fairly unique. Uh, Lucy mentioned earlier that one of the challenges challenges of bringing the circular economy to scale is issues around standards and certification. So isn't there a tension between on the one side trying to be much more uh, renaissance-like, but that of course also means any product almost becomes, it becomes unique, right? Versus trying to go to market, trying to you know, satisfy uh, more consumers. How would you see those two things come together? Well, you, you hit the spot, you hit us on the spot because um, the first thing in the top of the agenda of the industry is mass customization. And uh, this means that the public, the world needs customization. They need to have something unique. In our case, we are talking about distributed customization. So we are not to pointing towards the massive uh, idea of uh, big scale production, but we are talking about many nodes all over the world that they are distributed, that they can share the same knowledge, education, the same resources, tools, and the same database of uh, tutorials or uh, open uh, knowledge of how to fix things or how to make things and then produce locally and this is the distributed manufacturing what we what we call and this is happening at least in the in the case of the fab lab network we are heading towards there so we can produce a digital file of a garment of a bag, for example. And I can send the file, digital file to uh, Africa. They can use local African textiles with the pattern that I've sent to them. And they can produce locally there with a craftsman that will assemble it. And this also gives you this uniqueness in the products because they are all different because they are using only local resources. And I think that this is the future that I would like to dream of. Uh, that uh, of course, local circularity because it is boosting at the same time entrepreneurship, it is boosting uh, workplaces, it is boosting everything. And then a shared intelligence uh, globally with the uh, the, the network infrastructure. Wonderful. Uh, a great example in terms of fashion and how, um, you know, we could actually uh, have this, this level of customization based on, on a common pattern. Lucy, I know that uh, fashion is also something that you have worked on. So I'm interested to hear your take about, uh, take on how we can combine the idea of standards on the one side with customization and, and the idea that we have the ability to influence the way our products are shaped and produced. Uh, it was a great example related to fashion industry. It's easy, understandable for the wide audience, I'm sure about it. But my answer will be 
the same as before. It's related mainly to prevention or uh, with the minimalist style of living or minimalist lifestyle, slow lifestyle. Uh, doesn't matter which, which uh, term you choose. And it's about choosing high quality products, uh, long lifespan products, and um, just to use your critical thinking uh, during choosing of products, uh, which will, which, which you want to have in your life. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's not easy, but we can, we can see or we can find some inspiration in Japan, in Japan minimalism, why not? It's really interesting to read about it. Uh, even some, some research studies and papers, it's really interesting. Uh, so this is the way how to do that. Uh, according to the Ed, Ed Lansing hierarchy, it's always the same. It's always valid how to, how to deal with things in our lives. Uh, and if we will reflect it and respect it, um, we will be um, much more successful in implementing of principles uh, of circular economy, and we will be maybe more happy. Wonderful. I am myself still trying to um, adopt some of these Japanese minimalist practices in, in my daily life and, and try to assess to what extent different goods actually make me happy and therefore whether or not it's worth me owning them or whether or not they're just transient and therefore not worth actually um, you know, burdening myself with. So it is something that I think is a, is a really interesting way of thinking that, that might help us here. Um, we have, in a way, come also to the end of our time uh, on this, you know, really interesting uh, example. But um, we've learned a lot with, thanks to the two of you, uh, we've learned about your projects uh, that come from very different uh, perspectives, from an urban environment, an urban neighborhood perspective, to uh, a more uh, public sector oriented settlement uh, in, in a rural area perspective. Uh, so we got some really different aspects um, of how concepts of, of a circular economy can be implemented. I think it was really helpful to, in a way, get reminded that circular economy um, can support the sustainable development goals on a much broader uh, perspective. So it's not just about um, the reduction of waste but it is about new mechanisms in terms of uh, uh, sustainable consumption and production. It is about climate change. It is on um, also gender equality, which I thought was super interesting to, to hear about, that even in this area uh, and with more you know, female uh, innovators and entrepreneurs, we can make a contribution uh, towards that uh, sustainable development goal as well. Uh, it was also very helpful to get uh, a bit more of a rundown, what are the key aspects of the uh, circular economy concept? And, and Lucy reminded us of the three pillars um, that actually we need to all think about when we are trying to implement and, and, and foster a circular economy. So we've learned a lot in, in this time with you and, and we've learned about some really wonderful um, projects that you're both involved in. So let me thank you for the time today. And uh, with that, we'll bring this session to a close. Thank you. Thank you too. It was my pleasure.